second edition of Lunch with Lenny. And uh, I wanted just to say thank you very much for joining us. It is a cold and rainy March day. Um, probably not a, uh, not a better day to be working inside or at home. Um, and I'm, as I'm sure a lot of you are, but um, wanted to, first of all, say thanks for joining us. Uh, we are uh, living in strange days and uh, we just wanted to kind of help you take a break from all that and uh, talk a little bit about fishing. Um, uh, I'm Chris Charbonneau, also known as Sharb the Barb. The guy next to me is Lenny Rudo. I think you know that. Um, and before we get started, we're going to talk about crappy today. Um, but uh, Lenny, I just wanted to ask you one question. I know it's only March. We're about to move into April, but um, not too far from now is Mother's Day. Have you ever missed Mother's Day? Oh my, not that I can recall, probably, but I sure hope not. Yeah, I, I don't know if that I've missed it. I think I was telling you earlier that, you know, I think I probably called in just before the stroke of midnight, you know, just under the wire um, and, and made it, but always made sure that I at least give a phone call or whatever. Cards traditionally arrive late, so I usually get a pass on that. But um, anyhow, I mention this because one of the one of the things you got to do for Mother's Day, obviously, is to plan ahead and right? make sure you, you know, get the card out on time and all that. Well, this is serving as your reminder that Mother's Day is May 10th. Um, but we also have a special deal going on, a special contest, special opportunity. And that is, how would your mom feel if she woke up to the month of May's fish talk issue and... Uh, saw herself on the cover. I mean, I, I can't think of a greater gift to give to your mom than having her on your favorite fishing magazine. Now, it might be hers too, if you have a mom that loves to fish, awesome. Um, and so I just wanted to sort of plug this. Um, if you go to fishtalk, uh, fishtalkmag.com, if you go to the website, you can actually uh, uh, upload a picture. A, Make it try and make it a fishing themed. If mom, if you have a picture of mom with a fish, uh, click on the upper right hand corner on the home page, and it'll take you to the entry, and it'll tell you all the rules and all that kind of stuff. But um, uh, go ahead and upload that, and uh, you may be able to give your mom one of the greatest presents uh, any person could give their mom. Well, I'm gonna bring Lenny back here. There he is. Okay. So I think that's pretty cool, people. You can have your mom on the cover of Fish Talk Magazine. Come on, send us those pictures. We can't wait to see them. All right. Well, um, so let's do this. Um, Lenny. Let's get into fishing. Come on. Here we go. Come on. All right. So, folks, uh, there are a lot more of us than usual at home at lunchtime these days. So we thought this would be a great way to uh, get right back into the rhythm of helping you catch more bigger fish. And this week what we're going to talk about is crappie, right? Titles, the lures that they love and how you can fish them and catch more crappie. And you may have noticed if you've been watching the Fish Talk Fishing Reports throughout the course of the winter, the fall, the winter, the spring, crappie is an all season fish. It's a really great target species to go after. You can catch them pretty much any of the time of the year, really any time of the year. Um, they're great to eat. Uh, they're willing to bite. Great fish to go for with your kids. And uh, they're available all through the state. They're in the upper tributary areas where it's fresher water. They're in the ponds. They're in the lakes. They're in the rivers. So really good target to go after. So uh, to talk specifically about the lures we'll use for crappy, we have some pictures picked out. Chris, can we get picture number one up here on the screen, please? And uh, I'm going to go in order of my favorites, all right? So this is kind of my least favorite lure for crappie. We're going to start at the end of the list and work our way up to number one. And these are tiny little crankbaits. We're talking crankbaits the size of like a nickel. Um, they can be effective on crappie. A lot of people call them beans, bean lures, because uh, they're, you know, little, little beans. Um, the only thing is... You know, a couple things to notice. The first is they have treble hooks. I'm not a gigantic treble hook fan, um, especially when you have a fish with a small mouth. You're trying to get the hook out. 
It can rip up the fish if it's one you're going to release. It can get stuck in your thumb. A lot of problems with them. The other thing is these are diving baits that run at a specific depth. So if all the crappie are holding at exactly four feet and you happen to have one of these tied on that runs at exactly that depth, you're going to catch fish. Uh, but if they're holding at 10 feet, you're not. So it's not a very versatile lure. Let's scroll on over to number two. Let's see number two, Chris. Number two, whoa, whoa. All right, we got some technical issues. Not a surprise, people. We're going to work our way through them. See if we can get picture number two back up. That was a marabou jig. There we go. Um, so marabou jigs, I really like the most when I tip them with a minnow. Uh, this is a really good way to hit crappy uh, with a bobber rig. Let's say they're holding really tight to something. You need to cast it in there and leave it there. Uh, it's great to suspend one of these marabou jigs three, four feet beneath a bobber, tip it with a live minnow, throw it in there. Pick a small minnow and pick a small marabou jig. One thing to remember about crappies is they like to eat small stuff. They're not really into chasing after big giant minnow on big giant jigs. Um, so the marabou jig is good for that. Can you cast it and retrieve it and catch without a minnow on it? Absolutely but that's really probably not the number one top pick. Chris, can we slide over to number three here? Now, all right, here we go. So what you see here is if you look at this picture in the left, you see a little shad dart like lure suspended in midair. That's because this is actually a tandem rig. The fish has a hook in its mouth right now. Uh, I like using the tandem rig when I'm fishing under a bobber without bait very slowly. Um, you're going to cast out your bobber and just give it constant little jiggles, jiggle, 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 jiggle uh, as you slowly retrieve it. Um, in that scenario, these tandem rigs with just a couple little shad darts on them work really well. Those darts just go doo -doo 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 as you jiggle your bobber. And uh, it's a great way to fish when you're retrieving through an area, but you want to move it really slow. You, you can see I have all my gloves in this picture. This is winter fishing. Uh, it's a good winter tactic, a good cold water tactic. Summertime, not so much. Probably the fish are moving a little faster, but in cold water, that tandem rig is one to keep in mind. All right, Chris, let's hit the next one. All right, now, this is, whoop, let's see if we can get it back up. In the meantime, I'm going to remind people, if you have any questions as we go along, type them right in there on Facebook, type them in the comments. Chris will relay them to me and we'll get your questions answered. Don't hesitate for a minute to ask anything that pops into your head. All right, now what you see here is a blue and white tube jig rigged on a, I think that's a 16th of an ounce jig head. Um, it's a two inch tube, okay? And we're gonna go right to the next slide and we're gonna see a whole selection of tubes. These are my number one pick for all around crappy fishing, okay? These two inch tubes are shockingly versatile. You can be on a boat uh, over a suspended fish, drop them straight down and jig them vertically, highly effective. You can be on a shoreline where they're up in just a couple feet of water or say it's springtime, they're getting ready to spawn. You can cast them into the shallows and retrieve them back through. Pretty much any situation you're gonna encounter crappy, you can fish a tube jig. Now. Uh, why did I show you first the blue and white and then this picture? Because the blue and white is one of my very favorite colors. My other favorite, you can see in the lower right-hand corner of this little tackle box here, it's a red and white. Those red and chartreuses also down at the bottom are very good. The solid whites are very good. Um, now I see some that I don't use too often, that black and pink, uh, the, the black and chartreuse. They'll be effective sometimes. Okay, and this is one of the other things I love about fishing a tube jig is you can have that head on your line and switch out colors and just run through them one after the next, after the next, after the next, boom, boom, boom. It takes no time to change anything. You don't have to cut off and retie. You just slide a new tube on there and you can run through the spectrum. Um, but I'm going to say probably, you know, at the time that red and white, that blue and white, one of those is going to be your keys, maybe your solid white. Um, that, uh, let's say that, uh, black and pink up in the upper right hand corner, you know, that will prove effective. Sometimes there will be days when that's the only thing the fish want to eat, but they're only going to be, you know, three to 5% of the days. So you want to have this, you want to have this big selection. Okay. But you want to make sure you got your main ones covered. So what I do is I buy a box like this probably 
you know, I don't know, once every five years, once every eight years, goes into the tackle box. I run through them when I'm fishing. If I can't find, you know, if, if they don't hit one of my initial offerings, that blue and white, that red and white, that solid white, that's not getting hit. I'll run through these. I'll cycle through them. But probably every spring, let's go to the next one, Chris, I'll be buying one of these. Wake up, Chris. Wake up, Chris. Where are you? Come on. Next photo. There we go. Thank you, Chris. What we have here is a big bulk bag of red and whites. These I'll buy by the hundreds, okay? And the blue and whites and the straight whites. I got tons of those. I get that other tackle box with this big assortment, this big selection, um, simply so that I, I can always cycle through all those different options and, and see what's there. Um, Chris, let's uh, talk for just a minute about how people are going to get these right now, because of course all all the stores around here are, are you know that are not essential are closing down. We do have some good news in that regard. Um, we know that Anglers is currently open. Uh, you can call them on your cell phone from their lot or call ahead. They'll run stuff out to you. Uh, you do have to do credit card only. They're not handling cash. Uh, that's Anglers in Annapolis. Uh, Chris, why don't you put the nut? Yeah, thank you. We'll get the number up there. So if you want to go fishing, you can call ahead. Um, we also know for sure that the tackle box in Lexington Park is open. Uh, however, they're limiting people coming into the store. You may have to do social distancing outside the door before you can get in. Um, all tackle, all tackle is open. All tackle in Annapolis. Uh, they're asking for a call ahead. And if you call them ahead of time, um, they will have whatever you want ready. They'll run it out the door to you. Again, you can do it with your credit card. Of course, All Tackle has a massive, massive, massive uh, online operation. You can order from them online at alltackle.com. It's all one word. There's no dash like you see in here. Uh, that's a little snafu that doesn't belong there. It's just alltackle.com. Go to their site. You can click and order anything you want. Now, I'm going to say one other thing right now, people. We all know how disastrous the current situation has been for a lot of businesses. I'm telling you, don't buy this stuff on Amazon right now. Don't do it, okay? Buy from your local tackle shop. Call ahead. Of course, these are, you know, things are changing by the day. So call ahead. Make sure they're open when you need them to be open. Make sure you can give them a credit card and buy from them, please. Because what's going to happen here is a whole lot of local businesses are going to be hurting really quickly if they aren't already. And I love Amazon. I shop on Amazon. Uh, but I'll commit to you right here, right now, as long as this stuff's going on, I am not going to save a buck by ordering a big bag of crappy jigs on Amazon. It's not going to happen. Okay. This is the time to make sure that you support your local tackle shop. So let's do that, please. Um, Another another uh, fish talk supporters, Clyde's uh, up near Baltimore. I believe it's Halethorpe, exactly. They're still trying to figure out their hours and if and when they can open their doors. Um, but if you live up in that area and you want to go fishing, give them a call. Okay, just do that first. All right, Chris, can we please get to the next slide here? I want to go to the next one real quick. Uh, let's get it up on the screen because we're going to talk a little bit at this moment uh, about how to apply these lures, the whens and the wheres. Um, uh, that's one reason I put this photo in the mix. Another reason is because I love looking at pictures of my lovely, darling, wonderful daughter holding up fish. And this is my daughter, Molly. She puts together our weekly fishing reports. If you tune in and check these reports out and you appreciate them, uh, let Molly know by typing in a comment right now because she does one heck of a job gathering all that info and getting it out there, all the fishermen. So, but there is actually a real reason for this picture here. Um, if you look around the boat, you don't see anything, right? There's no structure. And crappy are very structure-oriented fish. You, you don't often find them out in the middle of nowhere. Happens on occasion, but not often. So what's going on here? Well, this is a picture from St. Mary's Lake. Those of you who have fished St. Mary's Lake in the past probably know that there's some areas of standing timber. A little early on me, Chris, but that's okay. You can you can go right ahead to that one. St. Mary's Lake has some areas of standing timber. Much of it is submerged. That boat is actually parked right now over top of trees that come up off the bottom in 15 to 20 feet of water, and they reach everywhere from you know 10 feet off the bottom to just under the surface. Occasionally, you rub one with your prop. This is a 
killer scenario to take those tube jigs and just vertically jig them from your boat. And that's exactly what we were doing. You can, you can anchor the boat, you can tie off on one of the broken trees or a couple in some areas that stick out of the water. And uh, you can just hover over these spots and catch the heck out of crappie, just vertically jig them. And one of the beauties here is, even though you're fishing among all this standing timber, it's pretty rare that you get snagged and lose your jig because you're just going straight up and down. If there's a, a tree you're going to snag, you find out pretty quick. You move a little bit. Sometimes just swing your rod from the front of the boat to the back of the boat is enough. So great scenario for those tube jigs. You cast one of those bean jigs in here, you will get snagged instantaneously. You cast a marabou jig on a minnow. That's also a good bet in here. All right, let's go on ahead to the next one, Chris. Now, what we're looking at here, uh, I, I hope you can see it. I think you can see it. Yeah, in the in the left hand side of this frame, right up against shore, you can see some trees laying in the water. Now, it doesn't look it from this photo, but that's because it's a GoPro photo, and it, you know it, it kind of changes things a little bit. But uh, it has a weird you know viewpoint. But those trees are actually within casting distance. This crappy was caught with a two jib, tube jig cast right up against that tree and retrieve past it. And the reason I wanted to put this one in here is because uh, once again, we're talking fish right on structure. You can cast that tube jig so it splashes down within a foot or two of that tree, maybe give it just a moment or two to sink and then start retrieving. And you'll catch a lot of crappie that way, uh, particularly in the late spring and in the fall when the water is not incredibly hot the crappy haven't retreated to deeper waters yet, um, so it's cool enough that they can be in an area like that. Uh, they'll they'll stick right up against those trees, beaver dams, anything like that is very very good crappy territory. Uh, this was also at St. Mary's Lake. This is in the cove all the way across to the right. There's some great spots back in there. You'll find great spots like this at Piney Run. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, a lot of the eastern shore mill ponds have blowdowns, although crappy there can be a little weird. Sometimes they'll just sit out in the middle of the lake over weed beds. That's a scenario you find quite often in the mill ponds. Uh, but generally speaking, this is, again, a wonderful situation for your tube jig. Uh, now, if the fish are holding super, super tight to that structure and it's really hard to get them to bite without casting so close into it that you get snagged, that's when you can go to that marabou jig uh, minnow bobber rig. You can cast that in there and let it suspend right on the edge of where you're going to get snagged, hopefully get bit, and then pull the fish out. Um, one thing you have to remember about crappy, if you're casting to structure like that and you are three feet off, you're never going to catch a fish. They are not going to leave the structure to go chase something down five, eight, ten feet away. It's not going to happen. you got to really pinpoint cast or vertically jig and put your gear right up against the structure. All right, I'm going to take a breath. Chris, do we have any questions coming in at this point? If we don't have any questions, I'll be shocked. We, someone's got to ask a question here. I'm sure there's something I haven't covered about catching these crappy. I hope I didn't lose Chris. I think that's not entirely impossible. <laughs> we're... we're Struggling through this new tech like everybody else. Okay, I'm here. There we go. Yeah, sorry. Chris, it, we have is, it is really hard to be like listening to what you're saying, getting these slides up, do it all. It, it's a some mental gymnastics going on on my side. <laughs> uh, well, I think the most important comment that I've seen so far is that Vivian Rudo thinks you're very cute. Oh, good. Oh, and handsome. And handsome. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, we do have a question though. Um, does the water condition uh, dictate the color of the lures you're using? That is a phenomenal question. Uh, heck yeah. Yeah, in fact, whenever it comes to lure color, I have a rule of thumb. Now, no rule holds 100% of the time when you're fishing, but this is a good rule to use. Uh, look at the water and match your lure color to the water color. In tannic water, root beer is a great color. In crystal clear water, white is a good color. In green water, chartreuse is a good color. Again, these are rules of thumbs. You know, it'll it'll change, but generally speaking, it's a really good rule to follow. Uh, and then this is 
I always say this to folks when they ask me about you know choosing lure color. Uh, think of it this way: we all know the old saying, "If it ain't chartreuse, it ain't no use." Right? right. Sorry. Yes. And My we have all the Chesapeake Bay, and the water color is generally kind of greenish, right? So it makes perfect sense. Um, Tim Elliott's asking, uh, how do you select the right size jig head, taking into account the water temperature, wind, and depth? And I would Great also like to see some more kayak fishing articles in the future. Ah, Zach. okay. Zach. Well, <laughs> we, we, we know you kayak guys are out there, and we love you. I love kayak fishing, too. Um, we will definitely pump as many of them as we can. Uh, we love the kayak angle. So uh, head size is a great question. So first off, the range is basically an eighth of an ounce to a 64th of an ounce, okay? Um, my general rule of thumb is to stick right around that 1 16th of an ounce zone. Uh, that is heavy enough that you can vertically jig it. It's heavy enough to get a little bit of a cast out of it. It's light enough it doesn't sink too quick. Crappy generally like a slow sink and then a kind of a hoppy retrieve. Um, again, just a rule of thumb, it changes. Um, but when the fish are going to be deeper, like if it's really cold out or really hot out, you're likely to find them in, you know, 18, 20, 22 feet of water down deep. You're going to need to go to, to an eighth of an ounce. Now, uh, again, I'm talking with those, with what we're talking about here, with the tubes, with the marabou. It's going to take a little more weight to get down. You may have to go all the way to a quarter if it's like really windy and you have a fast drift, you, you may have to go to to a quarter. A quarter is really heavy for this kind of fishing. And I, I want to circle back on this real quick and just mention for you guys who are going, oh my God, a, a 16th of an ounce. How am I ever going to feel that on the end of my line? Um, how am I ever going to cast that? Well, this is crappy we're talking about. When I'm crappy fishing and using this gear, I'm using an ultralight rig with four pound mono or maybe six pound braid. Really, really, really light line. So uh, when you get down that light, that 16th of an ounce jig, that eighth of an ounce jig, all of a sudden, you know, is, is a lot easier to work with. We got any other questions coming up? Uh, we do. Um, and I just found this really cool feature where I can actually show you the question at the bottom of the screen. So I, th I see Tim's question. That is awesome. So this we one got, we got a picture. Hold on. Oh, man, I missed it. We had a picture of him holding up a fish. Oh, I, I know, know. I know. There we go. Pickerel. Nice pickerel. Yeah. Nice pickerel. Nice pickerel. Timmy snuffed me out in the pickerel tournament, Zach says, by the way. Uh, so next one is uh, Kathy McKeel. Do you generally see a tandem rig? Do you use a tandem rig? So I, I go to that tandem rig when I want to do a slow retrieve and I don't have bait. And it's usually in pretty cold weather in a pond is generally when I'll use that. Um, that's when I cast it out and I can just jiggle that bobber really slowly back and keep that, that those lures jiggling down there. Uh, if I'm just straight up vertical jigging or I'm casting or retrieving, I normally don't. Um, and the simple reason is because if you got two hooks, you got twice as much chance of catching a fish, but you also got twice as much chance of snagging something. And since we're fishing so much in heavy cover, so much around trees, um, the, the tandem rigs, if you're just doing a straight cast and retrieve or a straight vertical jig, will get snagged up a lot more. It, it just happens. Um, you will catch fish with them. Don't get me wrong. You absolutely will. If you were in, let's say, oh, I got a great scenario for you. Uh, a couple years ago, I was fishing uh, with a couple people. It, it was late fall. We had a really hard time locating the fish. They were not on structure. We finally found them uh, on an underwater point about 22, 24 feet down, and they were hugging bottom on this point, 22, 24 feet down. Great scenario for a tandem rig because there's no structure to snag on, but it gives you a little extra weight. You can get it down there fast. You can jig it right off the bottom. Um, so, you know, in a situation like that, yeah, that might be a great situation to go to. Now, as far as the hooks go, normally with that kind of rig, I'm tying on either small shad darts or, or similar, you know, they might be marabou bodies, but um, generally it's the hook and the lure all together. I'm not doing a separate hook and bait or anything like that. Down. Great scenario for a tandem rig because there's no structure to snag on. Oh man. I'm getting feedback now. Well, that's a new one. Did you hear did I don't know if everyone heard that. I just heard myself talking, which is very strange. Uh Chris, do we have any more questions?
Okay. Can you hear me? I do. Okay, sorry. I, sorry, folks. Uh, it's just uh, me learning, learning curve. Uh, well, you know, good news here is, uh, you know, no matter what happens from here on out and all the stuff that's going on in the news, we'll probably continue doing this regardless, I think, um, as long as people like it. Uh, in fact, I'm going to add in, if you have any topics you want to hear about, you know, type them into the comments, too. We'll, we'll talk about doing them uh, next week. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, I'll get Zach in on this. He doesn't have enough to do. So um, maybe we'll have Zach in as a, as a guest or maybe even a replacement host for me. Since I <laughs> don't seem yeah, to be he's got nothing. He goes kayak fishing every day. Right, exactly, right? Yeah. So, so, uh, I so don't know. We're, we're, we're approaching the 1230 point. Do we have any more questions? To Oh, look at that. Okay, we can get another question. Any luck with spinner lures? Yeah, yeah, Bob. Um, Crappy will hit spinners. Um, I'm, I'm going to go right back to what I said earlier about the bean lures. The only thing I don't like about the spinners is a lot of them have troubles. Um, and, you know, again, it's just uh, much rather use the lure with a single hook. So I'll go to those tube jigs. Now, uh, another type of spinner you can throw for them is a really small spinner bait, like a beetle spin uh, is a good choice. Uh, a lot of the little perch spinners we use, like a perch pounder uh, that they have at Anglers or the uh, the uh, All Tackle also has a, a perch spinner bait, the perch prowler. Um, when you get into big crappy, they'll hit those. Generally speaking, your average school size crappy is going to hesitate before hitting something that big. So it wouldn't be my number one pick. Um, road runners are another. If you have a small road runner lure, you know, they have the, the spinner blade right on the back of the head. Those will pick them up sometimes. Cool. Um, yeah, we are kind of running out of time here. Um, yeah, Chris, you want to wrap it up for us? Yeah, well, I was going to ask you one quick question, and that is it looks to be a kind of a cold and rainy weekend. Um, if anybody's going to head out there to be solo on their boat or at least practice good social distancing, uh, you know, anything to – any tips for the weekend? Well, you know, it's interesting. The, the uh, snakehead bite has really come on recently with the warm weather, and then it really started to drop off again as it cooled off again. Um, I know this because I got there when it cooled off. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we've been getting good numbers of reports. I'm going to say check the reports at fishtalkmag.com. That's number one because okay. Molly will be diligently gathering information over the next couple of days here. And we have gotten in some interesting reader reports. There's some new things showing up. The shad have just started in some different areas so there are new options popping up but if you wanted to go catch crappy i would head for the easter shore mill ponds right now yep i would go to, and in fact you may you may see me bobbing around on my little boat out there in one of those ponds um cool. I, yeah it, it's uh you know those those ponds hold a lot of fish and they can be pretty darn reliable and um most of them most of them uh, offer pretty good fishing. One little tip on that, if you go to one of the mill ponds and nothing's biting, it happens sometimes, some of them just shut down. If that's happening, just pull the boat and go to the next one because it can be one way at Tuckahoe and a completely different story at Unicorn or vice versa. Oh, Zach wanted to comment that he caught five over 24 inches. Um, oh, wait, that's something totally different, I think. Uh, <laughs> um um, actually, Bob Daly uh, has some good advice, too, for the weekend, and that is wear your life jacket. The water is still pretty cold out there, folks. So, uh, and, there aren't a whole lot of, and there aren't a whole lot of people running around. That's right. To so, help you out. Um, uh, just be careful out there. Okay, I, I, I am going to wrap this up. Um, Lenny, thanks very much, and thanks to everybody who's tuned in. Um, I hope you enjoyed this, and uh, we'll, like I said, try and uh, make this a little bit of a Wednesday tradition. A um, couple of things. Uh, one, don't forget about the uh, Mother's Day contest. Go to fishtalkmag.com. Upload that picture of, um, uh, of of your mom or someone you know who's a very special mom, uh, and uh, she may find herself on the cover of Fish Talk, and that will be distributed across the entire bay. We do between 25, 26,000 copies each month. I mean, it's it's a big it, – I don't know. I think they really get a kick out of it. Well, maybe we'll even uh, get you a glossy picture of it and you can put it in a frame for Mother's Day. Um, on top of that, uh, don't forget uh, if you can't, if, if any of your stores that you normally go to, especially like 
with uh, the coffee shops and things like that during this time, if they're not open, and that's where you normally get your copy of Fish Talk, uh, you can always read online. Go to fishtalkmag.com and uh, you can read the latest issue. And actually, it's kind of neat. It's a flip book flip format, so it reads just like the magazine. Um, and we actually have back issues there too. So you can go through all of those if you want to as well. Um, cool thing about, uh, um, about the flipbook version is that the ads link to our advertisers' websites. Uh, so please, if you, you know, people have been asking, how can we help your business out? Well, if you want to help Fish Talk uh, out, read the online issue, click on those ads, and make sure that, uh, you know, that uh, the people that you uh, give business to know that you're a Fish Talk uh, reader. That and, for the next, and for the next couple of weeks, don't order on Fishing Tackle on Amazon. Go to your tackle <laughs> shop. Exactly. Support your local shop. Still, that's that's a great that's great advice. Um, and uh, if you if you just don't ever if you want to prepare for the situation in the future, you can always subscribe. We do subs we do send out subscriptions. Um, it's I think it's thirty five dollars a year for for it. Um, but anyway, you can also do that on our website fishtalkmag.com. Um, so with that, uh, speaking of sponsors and all those kinds of folks, um, I do want to just kind of thank um, uh, the people that do make this uh, possible. Um, All Tackle um, is a great supporter of Fish Talk. Um, we've also uh, got, uh, I'm clicking around here, sorry. Um, anglers, uh, uh, hunt, hunting and fishing, uh, please, they're, they're uh, also a strong supporter of ours. And also all the all the vendors that we have, all the advertisers that support our fishing reports, um, those come out every Friday. If you're not familiar with them, um, it, they're awesome. They're broken up by regional, but just we have the upper bay, lower bay. We go all the way down the bay. Um, these are the uh, sponsors of each one of those sections. Please, uh, if you don't get that email, sign up for it on fishtalkmag.com. Um, now, with that, I want to say thank you very much um, on behalf of uh, me and Lenny. Um, say thanks so much. Be safe and stay healthy out there. Bye, guys. Are we still on?